Hello, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Alexandra Lebret. Um, um, I'm here today on the invitation of the Sarajevo Film Festival to speak about uh, the, the condition when working with the streamers. I'm the managing director of the European Producers Club, which is an organization that gather 150, 60, maybe now, uh, producers, independent producers coming from 30 countries in Europe plus Canada. And, um, and I'm, I'm very proud today to have this conversation about um, this super important topic for us. Uh, what is the role that the streamers have taken into our industry and, and what is the consequences? What are the consequences on the independent sector? Um, I'm, I'm here today, a fantastic uh, panelist, of course, um, Chris Marsic, who is the, the CEO of the Croatian Audiovisual Film Center, Audiovisual Center, Lars Loge from the Norwegian Film Institute, and Ma Martrishka uh, Bosilova, a producer, member of the EBC, I'm proud of it, uh, from Agit Prod in Bulgaria, Pauline Durand Vial, the CEO of uh, FERA, the Federation of European Directors. Um, we all know that the, the lockdown have, um, have been an accelerator for, uh, of, of process existing in our industry, and I've seen the, the predominance of the streamers uh, in terms of audiences they reach, and, uh, but also in terms of business model they are bringing with them. Um, they, they are really a great opportunity for industry, uh, as long as they take part to the financing of it, to the protection of it, to the to part of the ecosystem of it. The European Commission has given the member states a way to um, protect that local industry with um, a regular tool. <laughs> Yes, a tool, a reg regulatory tool that allow member states to impose investment obligation uh, for these platforms in order to invest into the local um, ecosystem. But um, these investment obligation are very difficult to implement in certain countries and in particular the little uh, producing country. And even in some big countries such as Spain, this inve investment obligation are driven um, there's a big pressure of the of the streamers to have this investment obligation driven to in-house production. At the EPC, we do feel that the independent sector is in danger. We do feel that we need protection to have the financing of these uh, platforms going to the independent sector, respecting the European business model. Um, and that's why last March, we launched a code of fair practices um, when working with the streamers that is a very um, a, a simple info points, a very, very simple one, uh, which said that um, first, uh, an independent producer should um, keep revenues and rights of the IP he created, even if the IP is financed, IP intellectual property is financed 100% by the streamers, that um, the producers should keep also the ancillary rights and the, and, the, and the secondary rights of the work, meaning that it should not be take away of uh, the season two of the series he created, for instance, and then um, that he should also have access to data transparency uh, about the work he produced, what is the audience, and not, not only rough data, but really detailed data, and, and as well as having um, the, 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 the money the independent producers can bring to the project, thanks to the, 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 the film center, to the Norwegian film center, or to, uh, should, should correspond to the, in the share of the independent producers within the, 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 the financing of the work. So this code was really launched to create awareness about uh, a danger that we can feel as independent producer. But maybe I wanted first to have a first question about you, panelists, and in particular, Chris. Do you think that we are exaggerating the situation, or do you think that there is really a danger to react and to act and to protect the local sector? Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I 
congratulate you on the Code of Fair Practice. It should be a helpful tool if it gets uh, some momentum behind it. Um, no, I don't think you're exaggerating at all, maybe underestimating the problems for small countries. Um, <clears throat> you know, from, from our perspective, our independent producers are basically at risk of becoming and are becoming an endangered species um, because of the directive. I don't think it's fit for purpose. I don't think it promotes cultural diversity uh, because the commission has turned the deaf ear to comments that we have been making, I have been making for two years now uh, and the need to uh, cater to the particular needs of smaller countries. Um, and because of brutal lobbying by the major streamers in small countries where they can get away with things that they can't get away with in big countries, big markets. Uh, so we're not exaggerating uh, at all. And I'm happy to go into detail on the three reasons why I think you're absolutely right. And why if something's not done, uh, we will really become an endangered species. Um, cultural diversity certainly will not be served. Uh, and we will see the emergence of, uh, they are already becoming uh, the major streamers, uh, gatekeepers that provide core essential services. Uh, and without them, whether you like them or not, I think they could be very positive. Um, but without them, without access to them, without uh, some incentive uh, for them to look at uh, independent productions uh, in small countries. And there, it's not just the independent producers, it's also our authors who, are, who will be damaged, are being damaged. Um, it's gonna be very difficult to, to, uh, to survive in the, in the way in which we exist now, at least. Um, so yeah, you're not exaggerating. Martishka, do you want to, to react and give the position of you as a producer? Uh, am I exaggerating? Do you see, do you see the future as, a, as a, not dark, but a, a, a dangerous period? Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I think we are already in dangerous species. It's not uh, that it, this is coming, uh, uh, especially uh, filmmakers from our small countries. I'm based in Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, being producer for more than 15 years now. Um, uh, always struggling to, to get my place uh, on the market because uh, uh, first, before that in Bulgaria, cinemas nearly disappeared. We had, uh, we used to have like 60 uh, cinema screens uh, when I started. Uh, now with the pandemic, uh, theatrical release nearly disappeared. At the same time, platform are um, overtaking uh, and uh, here in my country, we still don't have the word platform in any kind of law or legislation or uh, some kind of directive or, or anything like that. So uh, I have to uh, find myself, uh, my place uh, and the place of, of my directors and, and the films really looking uh, for uh, uh, in the jungle, in the jungle of what's going on internationally and in the platforms to find them by myself. And uh, actually, um, I feel a, a bit stuck, you know, be between uh, the wishes to, to, to work with the platforms on one hand and on the other hand, really uh, trying to protect our voice and uh, the wishes of, of the filmmakers uh, that I'm working with. Thank you. That's that's true. That it's a it's a very difficult exercise to 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 tell this platform that are again an opportunity for us uh, that we want to work with them, but not under that condition. And it's always a balance that is very difficult to reach. When we launched that code of fair practices, uh, we were surprised by the range of people supporting it. It was not only. Uh, producers, but also uh, people coming from other parts of the industry. And, um, and, and in particular, uh, Pauline Ferra, we had uh, from Ferra, we had some, some directors joining us and uh, 
And for me, it was it, it was a surprise because I, I thought that maybe the directors would be super happy to be hired directly by by the, the platforms and having a chance to to skip the producer. Um, but but I, I've seen that a lot of your members are in favor of regulating this relationship. Uh, Pauline, can you tell us about what is your feeling uh, about this situation? Um, yeah, I think you're, you're quite correct in, uh, in your assessment of how our community perceives the arrival of these new players on the European market. Um, of course, everybody's happy to work, especially in these, uh, in these times uh, post-confinement, where, as we know, shooting was an impossibility and then became a, a warrior task for everybody is involved. So, voila, on that front, of course, uh, all work is very welcome. But there is no denying that, um, let's say that the business model that these platforms bring in and the impact on the local industry in that very peculiar moment uh, of, uh, of uh, rolling out the consequences of the crisis on the sector is definitely challenging the diversity of expression that uh, will be possible to put forth in the future. So for filmmakers, the fact that Maybe in certain countries, you will not be allowed to express yourself uh, in any way, shape or form, even if it's uh, a great entertainment and not necessarily the most uh, intimate art house expression. Um, that is really very challenging. So there is a sort of a freedom of expression, of artistic expression issue at heart here. And on the more industrial side, of course, the partnership with producers uh, is, is not something that happens only once uh, in a, you know, like a very temporary thing, this concept of having executive producers in front of you and not necessarily a producer that can maybe accompany you in your, in your uh, career, artistic career and, and so on is, is really challenging because even if you're not going to necessarily have the same producer when you work with Netflix and when you work on the development of your third feature, um, it, it doesn't matter. There needs to be a producer who can actually do this, this job of actually moving forward with different projects. And that requires, of course, independence and, and sustainability of business model for the independence. Just like we need sustainability of career development, which is an awful way to say, uh, a way to keep on working in, in that very particular job that directing is, but that's also, of course, true for screenwriters and, and all other creatives and talent involved. So. For us also, the, uh, the issue of, uh, of royalties payment is definitely there and, uh, and, how, and how we can somehow get a better sense of the relationship with the audience on these platforms. But maybe we'll talk about transparency of data and what that means a little bit later. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Lars, what is your feeling coming from, from, from Norway, where it, you have a, you are a little country, but highly producing and, and highly um, uh, demanded by, by, by the, the, these platforms and, and, and highly talented in, in series? What is your feeling? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you are right. And first, thank you for for letting me uh, letting me join in here. And uh, you, you you are right. In in, in Norway, uh, even during the pandemic, there was a tendency that there was more production than there had been for a while. So we had quite a few cri crisis packages stimulating for production, focusing on realizing the pro the productions that were ongoing. Uh, also uh, pushing funding into development so that people could uh, could develop new content as as the pa pandemic uh, rolled out and obviously now we're seeing as the cinemas are opening up and uh, people are worrying about the market on how to uh, how, how the audience will react uh, we are seeing um, what some kind of jokingly calls the bloodbath of too many Norwegian films going out at the same time killing each other in uh, distribution. So, so how does the streamers come into this? Uh, they come in in the sense that now the Norwegian producers are starting to finance their, their projects with, with uh, <clears throat> I don't have the sums but of the streamers, but their cinema window uh, is being challenged by them being able to sell to the streaming platforms at the same time. 
which is uh, creating quite a lot of conflict, obviously, between the cinemas and the streamers. And uh, and we, as a national film fund, are getting uh, challenged all the way of demanding a longer window uh, behind our funding. So we're trying to find out how do we relate to to the international streamers coming in. And, and the way we, we've uh, decided right now is that at least because we're becoming inc increasingly a decre decreasingly important part of the global market for the Norwegian producers. So at least we can say that we can equip uh, the Norwegian independent producers with uh, thorough uh, development funding so that they can position themselves in a very complex market. That means that they can uh, maybe get three times as much for developing a project now in order to both to get the artistic and uh, um, financial uh, strategy in place so that they reach a point where they decide of, uh, for production uh, where they can choose themselves. Either they can go for all rights with the streamers. Uh, that means that they will never get funding from us. We uh, then uh, retreat from the project. And it's not because we think it's bad that they go to the streamers. I mean, if that's who they produce for, then fine. Uh, but it's protecting the national funding towards national content and, and national uh, uh, producers and directors. So our entire fund uh, no longer will be available for, for those who uh, produce, who give away their IP rights. They have to own them themselves. That's a very good answer, and um, and and as as you said, you are um, uh, under pressure on many sides, the windows mm. uh, and the, the IP. Can you? I'm not sure. I I understand your concept of increasingly, increasingly involved. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's as as big of a linguistic problem as it is uh, a content problem. Uh, uh, the market has grown substantially the last five years much due to the streaming the streamers so the 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 roads that a producer can take to realize their project is becoming more and more uh, broad towards the streamers our fund is not growing annually um, significantly so we have to figure out how uh, our limited funding uh, gets the highest possible effect uh, which means that it's going to be harder uh, that it will be uh, no chance to uh, finance production funding of projects that are not owned by Norwegian ind independent producers. And we also have to put the money into development. Positioning of the Norwegian producer in this market will be increasingly important. That's, that's a very good answer. Chris, what, what tools do you have at your disposal to protect the independent sector? Um, you are negotiating... 2%, 5% of investment obligation, do you dedicate them uh, for the independent sector? How do you protect the fact that the producers keep the IP? What, what, are, what are the tools you are developing to, to develop and enhance your, your local ecosystem? So we have, uh, we provide financing for production. It's stable uh, from year to year, including during the pandemic uh, and there, the presumption is that the independent productions will, uh, the producers will be able to keep their rights and that they, <clears throat> they uh, can be protected in that way. What we're trying to do with the new law and the implementation of the uh, Audiovisual Media Services Directive is introduce a, an investment requirement. And um, our, our, estimate have been that um, at least 5% of revenues generated in Croatia would need to be invested in independent production. Um, and we, we had a lot of up and down, ups and downs with that. Uh, there was intense lobbying, not to, call it, not to say bullying here, uh, with implicit threats of leaving the market if we introduced investment obligations from three major streaming platforms together, by the way. Um, in the end, the legislation will have a 2% investment obligation for independent productions. Uh, hopefully it will grow. The ministry 
provides assurances in that direction, but now the legislation says 2%. We may get some improvement in parliament that's going into second and final reading in September. Uh, so we're trying there and we're also, we're also looking at more investments uh, from telcos, believe it or not. It looks like uh, as they're positioning themselves to compete in the market, we have two major international players coming in. Uh, we will have an obligation for them to invest in independent production, which could be um, the dark horse um, uh, savior in this race if, if the predictions materialize. Uh, we'll see. And then um, broadcasters with a national license, private broadcasters with a national license, will need to be investing initially 2%, but going up to 5% of their revenues in independent production. So we're trying to build up investments from other sources in the independent uh, in independent production um, that should provide that should provide some relief although the position market position of broadcasters has slipped as it has everywhere with the advent of streaming and do you reinvent yourself as well as um, as the norwegian film institute as uh, as explainers uh, your role uh, the way you invest into independent production uh, with this new context, or do you just securize and, and secure uh, the legal, your lo local legal framework before uh, going into details in your own fund and the way you, 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 you finance projects? We certainly focus on securing the, the sources, uh, but we're also in, e in, in, uh, in the law trying uh, to provide some guidance to make sure that it's, that, that the investment is in independent uh, production. So rights retention, um, there's a whole code of good practices that have been agreed with broadcasters and the concepts are you know, in line with, uh, with what you've been doing at the APC, not as ambitious. So we're, we're trying to build that into the law uh, and uh, strengthen the position of the, uh, of the independent producers so they retain more rights so that they can develop so that they can eventually build up some libraries it would be nice to have uh, some even medium-sized producers who, who have a library who would be working with uh, authors uh, directors here and, and developing the base basically for the future and so yeah we, we do try to encourage movement in that direction but the, the focus initially was on getting the uh, sources secured. Mark Fischka, what, is, um, what, what are your needs when you are listening to, to Lars and, and Chris? And, uh, what are your needs? How do you feel that you need to, to be changed or where do you need to be a company in order to grow and to continue to produce? And what are the big threats? Uh, Lars mentioned the windowing. I mentioned the IP, uh, as well as Lars and, and Chris. What is your, your most urgent needs? What are, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, actually I'm encountering the same issues that were mentioned already. Although I, I would wish uh, our film center would, uh, would um, already um, point out these tasks and goals uh, like in the Norwegian Film Institute or even uh, Croatian uh, Audiovisual Center, because um, in, in my country, uh, it's, it's one of the very, very few countries where the budget for film is coming directly from the state. It's not a funding system, uh, which makes it even more complicated. And it's, uh, it's not possible actually to negotiate with, um, with the corporations in media, et cetera, uh, for any kind of in investment. So uh, for us, is really a challenge. So uh, there, there are two ways for me as a producer. One is the traditional one, you know, uh, uh, European co-production uh, construction that is the classical one. 
and that is very very difficult at the moment in uh, in uh, terms of pandemic uh, uh, situation. Uh, at the same time, since uh, my background is documentary film production, and actually this panel is uh, produced by Documentary Campus for the sake of it, uh, I must say that uh, I, I can really see a trend at the moment that a lot of independent producers, especially from my region, they are investing themselves together with the filmmakers in order to keep the independence of the production and uh, to make uh, more possible uh, to, to make a better deal with a streamer or really to, to try to, to keep the IP uh, uh, for the future when the things are getting more um, uh, b better for, for us as filmmakers. Um, this I can see a lot, even uh, the projects you, you are going to see here at Cinelic in uh, Sarajevo um, uh, that are in the, the work in progress section are very much like this as well. So, um... I know that the situation of the documentaries is the same as feature films and TV series as uh, there's also that boom uh, that the streamers are, are, are having, uh, that, that appetite for, uh, for the documentaries. Um, but you mentioned the fact that there is another model when you were working with the broadcasters and, and, and were working with the streamers. We spoke about the IP. What about the data transparency? Is it something that is important for you as a producer and then to put in? Uh, isn't a key question for you for the future as well? Uh, of course, uh, I, I think this must be part of, of uh, the entire rules and regulations in the future and that uh, Europe and European Union must uh, um, has this uh, have this uh, obligation uh, to 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 make it uh, in a in a proper way, especially within the uh, uh, within Europe, uh, because uh, otherwise uh, we are really uh, entering very very risky zone, uh, and a lot of countries like my country, for example. Uh, are really not relevant in that sense because uh, uh, we are uh, really small uh, stream. Uh, we are the last stop for for uh, any kind of or original investment uh, for original content, etc. Uh, so uh, it's it's very very important for us. Um, uh, and it's relevant uh, in how ambitious we want to go because uh, producers like myself, re we are really aiming uh, ambitious. So for us, uh, this is very, very important um, uh, how, how we make it locally, but also internationally. And uh, this must be regulated as soon as possible. Paulina? I think this is one of the most important points of uh, the Code of Fair Practices that the EPC reached, uh, getting data transparency, because it's, uh, it's all about um, knowing the urgency for which we are uh, creating uh, the work. What is your, your position in that? So for, uh, from the perspective of the filmmakers community, um, data transparency would be essential on Two, because of two reasons. One is purely economical and it has to do with the fact that um, uh, clearly if you have no clue of uh, the actual following and, and success of the work towards the audience, there is a massive problem for you to evaluate the value of your intellectual property that we transfer uh, partially or in entirety to the producers or to the platform, depending on the type of contracts we're looking at. But, um, but definitely in order to negotiate properly your royalties payment, if you have no clue about the performance of the work towards the audience, then you're basically negotiating blindfolded and we all know how that ends. So <laughs> that's not ideal. Um, the second part of it is maybe a little bit more complex and, and clearly is a little bit difficult, I think, sometimes to, to absorb um, when we're looking at industry uh, discussions, is it has to do with, imagine a world where you don't have any idea of the reaction of the audience 
to your content? How do you build yourself as a creator or even as a very talented entertainer if you have no clue of the reaction of the audience towards what you create? What are you going to develop in the future? Are you going to develop only what a commissioner tells you to do based on an algorithm? How do you make your writing evolve? How do you make everything? Because all of this is a little bit more subtle than just getting instructions from somebody over Zoom who is having access to that data. We, we need to have a, a more um, uh, sensitive relationship to this, to, to what the, the audience uh, absorbs. And we know about you know, the change of demographics. We know about um, uh, the multiplicity of screens. And of course, when you create for a small screen, it's not the same thing as creating for the big screen. So you, of course, everybody evolves slightly, but um, if you listen to the greatest filmmakers we have in Europe today, we've had a couple of these people telling us in, in various events that we organized last year that actually this um, creative blindfold that is put on their eyes, even if it comes with tons of money for the budget, is really, really bad for them. Because as creators, as I said, they need to have a bit of, you know, relationship with the audience to, to, to build forward. So I think these two aspects need to be kept in mind. And as far as the rest that of, of what was said, I would say that um, this blindfold thing comes with the rest of the business model of these platforms, which is mercifully understood and and um, and uh, not necessarily fought, but at least tackled by our film funding uh, system in Europe, um, is the risk of commoditizing content, of making it small and insignificant. Just let's produce for the sake of producing and just let's do that. That's enough. No need for IP, no need for anything. We know where that leads. That's if you make the comparison with food, this is fast food. And, and even if we all love fast food, sometimes in our lives, uh, we also like slow food and we want to still be able to eat that as, as uh, consumers, right? So I think it's pretty much the same when we're looking at the evolution of the business model that we're seeing today. And, and strangely enough, it happens to us much later than it has happened in other industries. And we're being very naive about it. So I think it's really great that we can actually discuss this and be a little bit more firm in ourselves. This is not only you know, fancy talk about cultural diversity or freedom of creation. This is about the quality of what we want for our kids, our parents, our neighbors to watch. This is, this is what we're talking about. It's not only about the money. It's also about, you know, our souls. I know it sounds stupid to say it like that, but there is something about, about that going on. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think transparency of data is one important piece of that big picture. That's so agreeable to see someone so passionate, even by <laughs> Zoom, Pauline, that's fantastic. And you were speaking about some, some, some sensitive reaction, and we're having a question from the chat, which is also a reaction from a, from, from a Zoom that I, I would like to answer. The question regards the, the rest of the streamers. We are, we are speaking a lot about the big streamers, but are the, the questions that we are raising the same for the local streamers? Last. You have a lot of uh, local streamers in your country. Uh, are the issues that we are discussing uh, the same in, in for them, for the, the, the other players? I know, for instance, that in, in, in certain countries, I would not denunciate anyone, but uh, the, the, the streamers are, are taking advantage of this new business model to push the old business model in that direction and to and to ask all the rights and to create originals and, 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 and to apply the same business model. That's the case, for instance, in France. Um, do you have also, also that in your country? And See, I had forgotten how this worked in a long and nice summer. I'm sorry. Uh, we do have some local uh, streamers, absolutely, and uh, Nordic streamers, and uh, our relation to them is, uh, it's, it's basically the same when it comes to the rights question. We don't deal differently with uh, the smaller uh, streaming services, because our focus is quite hard on the independence of the producer. So the, there are no particular other moves that we have towards smaller streamers, no. 
I just want to add as well that we also have um, a process. We're, we're very slow in Norway to actually implement the uh, what we call the the investment uh, demands for the streamers into Norwegian content. But we we hope that this will be settled uh, this uh, this fall or maybe next spring. And we're probably going to land somewhere like Chris is saying around five to five to eight percent. We don't know. It's up to the cultural department, but that's a parallel process to to us uh, tightening our regulations towards the streamers. That's a, that's a very low level. Um, I've, I've read that uh, Netflix only Netflix has announced seventy shows to be commissioned in the Nordic. Mm. Seventy. Mm. You know that's why. Um, I, I understand the question about mm. uh, the streamers being uh, not reachable for filmmakers, but but actually they are. They are going in, in deeply into local markets, yes. and uh, and and not only uh, the bigger the bigger one, but also uh, in, mm. in little countries because they want to be local, and and, and that's great. Mm. But uh, they are coming in. Uh, they are, and, and, and the duality of it is what we're discussing here is, is, is difficult to navigate in because it's very positive that they want local and regional content, of course, and, uh, and uh, in some cases it gives the producers the ability to go from a local market to a global market as well, if you have that on your CV, to put it that way. Um, but the, uh, protecting the cultural uh, significance of the Norwegian culture, which is, uh, of course, uh, the main aim of the National Film Institute, that is not directly satisfied by the investments of the streamers. So what I what I wish for is that that there also a solid part. This is just my personal opinion. This is not this is not um, the department, but uh, to have money funded through the public financing, I think would have a much more um, uh, focused uh, f- effect for each local culture's output of their own stories. So some some reinvestment in uh, in regional content, but also some money funded into into the the public funders. Chris, what do you, how do you react to this question? Well, there've been a lot of interesting comments on on that question. Uh, we we do see local streamers coming into the market. They're Frequently, uh, or at least amongst them, you have uh, uh, exhibitors wanting to set up a streaming service. Uh, They want to condition their deals with uh, producers on acquiring the rights for for the linguistic base here. Uh, And so they have the same, I mean, I I suppose it's an, an instinct of business to try to get all of the rights you can. Uh, but the streamers we have here uh, don't have reach beyond the linguistic base, and, and so they don't offer the same temptation that a, an international streamer will offer uh, to to a producer. Uh, and in fact, uh, they can take themselves out of the market with the international streamers if they start to uh, chop up the rights. In fact, we're seeing as one of the consequences of this directive, whether intended or not. Um, a diminution of the importance of territoriality uh, as, as such. Uh, and I think the directive has, has uh, made it clear that uh, all rights included, global rights included is a model um, that is taking hold. Territorial licensing exists, it will continue to exist. I think uh, for some of us, it's, it's essential for others. Uh, like the big players, it's not. It's a, it's a it's a kind of a safety net for profit maximization, but they're, they're moving into the uh, global all rights, uh, all rights environment. So, um, and I, I suppose in reaction to an earlier point on data, I agree with Pauline, uh, data is crucial. Uh, we producers, authors need to know what's happening with their works. And as I said earlier, these international streamers are becoming gatekeepers, and you know they 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 decide what will be what will be streamed where, and they also hold all of the data that's necessary uh, for their uh, customers, producers, and and rights holders uh, to have. I mean, I, they have thousands of so-called business clients who make uh, make movies who need the data. 
to know what the, how, how, the, how the consumers, the millions of consumers they have there are reacting. So without transparency in data, um, it will be difficult to understand, uh, understand the market. And also, you know, like it or not, Pauline, artificial intelligence is also a tool that's being increasingly deployed. Um, you know, it may homogenize product in the future, I'm afraid it will, uh, but I can't stop it. And if you don't have the data, um, you can't feed those models that generate artificial intelligence based recommendations, uh, analyze alternatives, and whatever, whatever AI can do, uh, the magic that it does. Um, so yeah, transparency is crucial. Yes, there are certainly gatekeepers and, uh, and, um, and, and they are becoming more and more important than uh, when, when we launched that code of fair practices, people were telling us, are you crazy? You are going against the most important and the most powerful people in the world. Pauline, to take your, your, uh, your view, your example, it's like fighting my McDonald's, you know, how can you fight McDonald's? But you are French, so you can fight McDonald's. Anyway, let's speak about the, the temptation that, that we present. Someone mentioned that it's a temptation and how can we, react as an industry to this temptation. They are temptation because they can give a, a very fast answer and they can finance easily a work and they can um, make a work existing in, in very fast. Lars, you mentioned the fact that you are now investing usually in, 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 in development, which is great. Um, at what moment do you decide a producer's Let's take an example. Matryska is a producer from Norway. She's uh, developing an IP, a, a documentary series, and she's coming to you uh, to have a funding uh, of, a, of a project. And at certain point, she decides that maybe she will work with a streamer. Is that possible? How do you, how, at, at what point do you decide that it's not possible and, and, and this is not a work for it? Um, how, how, how do you manage that? I, sorry, <laughs> I think quite simply in the way that we do we do finance the the development phase, and if uh, if in the development phase, uh, uh, Matishka finds out that uh, that she's going to the streamers and selling the all rights, then it's uh, fine by us. You keep the um, you keep the financing, uh, and you go on with a new partner, uh, and that could be in development phase one, two, or three. So we don't. I mean, we actually just focus on uh, the Norwegian independence developing the best possible content that they can and position this content to wherever this particular project's audience is. Uh, so to uh, so we want to make it easy and uh, and uh, kind of prevent the the famous uh, sprint towards production that uh, all uh, European producers go through where you don't get enough time to develop your script, you don't get enough time to test uh, actors, to do the casting, to all the content stuff that, that you should be able to do in, in economic calm uh, waters. We want to make that more possible. And we also want the producer to have more uh, funding in order to set up a finan financial plan for this project. And if that financial plan involves a streamer where, where uh, he or she wants to sell, and all rights, then then it's fine in the development phase. You, you won't get funding if you've already sold your your uh, your IP. Uh, but if you change it in the midst of development, then so be it, because then you have made a, a financial plan, a business plan for this project. You will just not get any uh, production funding from us. And in that, uh, we've already experienced a couple uh, or times or three, because we changed these regulations in March or in February this year. We've already had uh, quite friendly phone calls from drama series producers saying that they're, they're, they're in a much better uh, negotiation position towards the, the streamers when they can actually say that, that the streamer has to choose if they want to reduce their financial risk by 
by letting go of the IP to the independent producer and the independent producer can get financing of let's say 10 to uh, 10 to 60 percent of the project that will obviously be cheaper for the streamer um, but they have to leave all rights with the producer and they have to reduce the territories as you're saying chris so we we want to strengthen strengthen the 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 producer in the situation where they go to the main financer that they can tell netflix that you have to buy everything if you want the rights you have to pay for absolutely everything um, but we would like to sell you a limited uh, time and territory limited uh, uh, license, which would then uh, be cheaper for the for Netflix, and we would finance production, and they, and then hopefully, and then most likely, it would be a production with Norwegian cultural content in Norwegian in the streaming platform. It's just an example. So well done, Martishka. Assessing your application uh, live it was uh, it was very nice. <laughs> Martishka, do you feel that you have a bargaining power uh, as an independent producer uh, when you are speaking with big players? Uh, well, uh, it's um, yeah. Situation you described sounds like utopia for the moment. <laughs> Um, but um, well, uh, what I feel strong because uh, I have great talent behind, and uh, I represent really talented filmmakers. And uh, also, I put a lot of efforts myself uh, to educate myself throughout this uh, couple of years. Uh, really, how to approach, how to pitch, how to communicate within these changes. Uh, and um, uh, having the streamers already as main players. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, I really would wish that uh, uh, there can be a situation uh, for co-production like, uh, like it was so far, by the way, for example, with HBO, that was very strong with, uh, within Eastern Europe uh, uh, until recently. Now situation is changing there as well because of the competitive uh, market. Um, and not, uh, I, I'm looking forward to really diversifying uh, the market because Europe is so complicated uh, and we really need uh, a new, new kind of possibilities or, or startups like uh, uh, we have quite positive uh, um, uh, experience with movie, for example, that uh, we had our movie Touch Me Not that won Bellinale a couple of years ago. Um, so they have different model, uh, but unfortunately they don't they don't uh, produce originally, or maybe they are thinking about it uh, in a different condition, uh, which which can be much more friendly to to the independent uh, filmmakers and. Uh, much more supportive. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether this will work, but uh, uh, maybe this direction can help. Someone in the chat, the same Jan, I, I believe that the, the other one, we, are, we have only one, one, one uh, people attending our event, uh, as asked, um, I said that we will never succeed in having uh in 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 having what we are asking for uh that we only regulation will bring us that what do you think chris yeah i i did agree with that comment i think that um some additional regulation and, and monitoring is needed to keep um the gatekeepers in line basically i i don't believe in over regulating but i think the state has some responsibilities. And we've had long discussions about this within our ministry, which by the way, is, it's crucial to have a ministry uh, that understands the issues and at least tries to find solutions within, within the limits of what they feel they can do under pressure. And we have that uh, luxury. The ministry is very understanding. And we've, we've talked precisely about that. There is uh, an insufficient amount of uh, harmonization at the European level uh, to really uh, avoid a situation in which uh, the gatekeepers can do whatever they want and can also 
um, do a sort of a divida et tempera sort of approach uh, in Europe, which they're doing uh, quite well. I mean, they treat my region, uh, Matishka's re region, um, differently to how they position themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis others in, in, in the EU, uh, and also differently to what they say publicly in European discussion forums, where they show a lot of flexibility and understanding that doesn't translate into concrete uh, performance. And to get the concrete uh, performance, you, you do need legislation uh, to deal with data, to provide some baseline um, for smaller countries to find their place uh, and to continue to be able to uh, have outlets for the content they create. Uh, and monitoring, I think, you know, the Digital Markets Act is an interest, I've been reading that lately, and I think that's an interesting uh, regulation that, uh, that has as its goal uh, to deal with gatekeepers precisely, it has some, inter some definitions in there. Uh, but in any event, I think that concept has some application to the challenges we face. And without something like that, uh, it's going to be difficult. Pauline, do you agree? Chris is, uh, is, is using a lot the word of gatekeeper, which, is, uh, uh, which refers to a regulation that is uh, under discussion at the EC level. Uh, regarding the digital, it's called the Digital Market Act, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm just explaining that for the audience, and that tries to regulate uh, the business relation between the, um, these gatekeepers and, and, and the business users, uh, and, and not taking advantage of a dominant position. Do you agree, as Chris, that these platforms are gatekeeper and they are controlling the market? Well, I think if, if we're speaking in uh, general industrial terms, absolutely. I think that's something that we see uh, in the daily dealings that all the, the, the parts of the industry has uh, in terms of interactions with these players. Um, however, the problem that we have is that this, these two texts, the DSA, DMA uh, package, is, are very interesting in, in the concepts that they lay out, but somehow it seems that uh, global streamers and the audiovisual industry completely fall into right in between the cracks of these general definitions and, and what is trying to be tackled by the European um, legislator in this particular instance. And that's why you're there, Pauline. That's true. However... Uh, and Alexandra on... and others, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's worth looking at. Well, I mean, the thing is, you also have, when you're a small lobbyist like myself, I'm, I'm saying this in very intently, like one and a half persons in an office in Brussels doesn't give you the clout to negotiate uh, something that would be truly meaningful in such a complex generalistic package that deals with fake news as well as uh, whatever the planet needs. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit complex for us to, to be efficient about. However, um, I think this is a beautiful opportunity for us to really very loudly say, and in that sense, we're very happy to work with the EPC on that, to say, well, I mean, if this text is not the right vehicle, you still have to take care of that issue because this gatekeeping problem um, of these new players will have an impact on the sustainability of our sector, on cultural diversity, on whatever policies you want to develop at local level to still have an industry that can provide entertainment and hard house uh, audiovisual works. So you, you, there, there is a, a, a real hook there for us to really fight for something that uh, will hopefully lead to better harmonizations of uh, these provisions that we see uh, translating at national level on the um, AVMS directive, which has to do with uh, investment of uh, these players. And really, it also allows for us to keep on talking about this with the different people involved. Otherwise, in Brussels, you might risk uh, five years of complete silence because your issues are not popping up anywhere in legislation. So that's right. In that sense, it's really good for us to keep campaigning and to and to really try and find where we can find the proper European legal hook to really sink our teeth I in. Think so. yeah, video sharing uh, platforms are within scope, so it's it's not that the sector is entirely out. And I, I agree with you. You you have to use. We have to use 
these debates to put more of a focus, to, to put a focus on yeah. the sorts of issues we've been talking about, which are market failures. Uh, and, uh, you know, the commission is there to resolve some of these. In my humble view, uh, they should have some uh, sense of responsibility and obligation to address these sorts of issues. Yeah, and we do also have the European Parliament with a number of MEPs who are quite sensitive to these uh, to, to what's at stake here, uh, which is highly political and completely has to do with um, retaining something, retaining economic value, retaining uh, an ability to speak to our own local audiences in the way that we instinctively feel is right. You were talking about AI and the link with data. Of course, AI is now present in editing a little bit, in virtual production solutions, of course. And you know what? That's probably the, the way of history, right? But nonetheless, if those technical solutions are developed completely outside of our remits um, by global players who really design these tools in a way that is completely outside of our own instinct and our own uh, habitus um, in terms of, of producing and creating, then we're going to have a big problem because they're going to own the IP of these tools and we're going to be even more dependent. So it's, it's a little bit like what happened with, uh, with uh, um, uh, screening in theaters. You know, when we move to digital technology, all of a sudden, you know, all the technology to, to screen was no longer ours. Um, and, and that's additional costs and everything that comes with it. So, yeah, there is, there is definitely something in terms of anchoring ourselves and our economy and our in our ways in in European legislation more for sure. So this is so good. I I, I don't know how to conclude you know better than <laughs> that than, than with Pauline's words. We need we need to uh, this is a strong message that we need to send to the European regulators and the national as, uh, as well about the need uh, to repair these market failures as you said. Uh, that these gatekeepers are using uh, to their own advantage and, uh, and, and in which we can disappear very soon. Um, and it's a call also for unity and, and, and putting you representing the directors, you are here as a, as a film uh, center. And I think it's super important that we, we make that call as a, an industry problem. It's not a producer problem. It's not a, a other problem. It's an industry problem. Um, so that's that's the uh, what what can I say more? Come and join us. <laughs> Come and join us. We are we are here to defend the independent sector, and we want to work with the streamers as well. So that's that's we want them to uh, produce our content, but on the way uh, where we are protected and, and, and we can continue to produce high quality uh, of project and, and knowing the audience for which we are producing. So come and join. And thank you so much, Pauline, Chris, Mark Rischka and Lars for uh, your contribution. You have been um, very clear and very helpful. And we can see that everyone is trying to move in the right direction. Thank you very much. <laughs>